Uh, welcome. We have the after lunch party, so we'll do our best to just you know, kind of keep it interesting and moving forward. My name is Abby Turner, and I'm a cheese maker with Lucky Penny Farm in Creamery. And uh, this session today is to talk about our 2009 uh, Sarah Grant, which is best mentioned was a farmer rancher grant. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, I'm going to talk about what we did, and then we're going to talk about what happened since then. Um, obviously, 2009, 10, um, and 11, a few years ago. And uh, it actually is a very good thing because it allows us to see what uh, minimum investment that Sarah made, really what it's turned into, which is fantastic. So I'm going to go prior to Sarah, and I'm going to redo the part where everybody knows the the Margaret Mead quote, um, which is, um, never doubt that a group of committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, you know, it's the only thing that ever has. And we were uh, part of a uh, summit, the Steiner Summit uh, through OSU in October of 2009. And who's attended that summit before? Anybody? Okay. So they, they vote on projects and, and award funding to to projects that are voted upon by the community that is there that day. Okay, it's part of that open space project. So everybody's supposed to be there, that is there. Everybody gets one vote, um, and you get to put little stickers on projects that get funded. So people in the room stand up and they say, I'm interested in uh, hoop houses. Um, I'm interested in seed extension. I'm interested in cheese. I'm interested in whatever the agricultural uh, project that they're interested in. And then people go to that corner. So let's say you want to do something with um, spinning. Okay. So you go to the corner, and then everybody says, oh, everybody wants to go spinning, goes over and will walk. And, and then you'll kind of create a project, all right, out of nothing. So in October of 2009, a project that was created by Brian Schlatter and myself was Ohio Cultures okay, and Sheep Cheese. This is the piece of paper that was stuck up on the wall in October of 2009, to try to create a project that would be using indigenous Ohio cultures to make cheese. Okay, so that's where this project started. And it lasted there for about 25 minutes, where it was like, well, this might not end up being something that is commercially successful because it's a very, you know, we want to maintain consistency and it'd be very hard to work with multiple farms. So, you know, what is another daring, artist daring thing that we can work on? And the next thing was sheep cheese. So, huh, well, this is kind of interesting. Um, Ohio has a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for sheep cheese. Okay? At the time, there were nobody was milking sheep, all right? And there were no artisan sheep cheeses that were, were made locally on the market. Um, the first producer was Ben Sipple, back here, Ben. Um, Coco Borrego, they were the first folks to get licensed, and um, I'm sure Ben will have quite a few thoughts to add to whatever we talk about here today. So in 2009, there were none. So we, more people came over to the group. Um, a chef came, Parker Bosley. Um, Kathy Bielek came over, who had done some Sarah projects before with uh, parasite resistance in sheep. Uh, Sarah Horowitz came over from the Ohio Israel Agricultural Initiative, um, just because she likes sheep, and Israel has a great, you know, a large sheep dairy um, culture. And uh, Leah Miller came over from the Small Farm Institute, and we sat in a round table and just said, what can we do to you know, build sheep dairying in Ohio? So we talked about it, and then got up, presented our ideas, and so did the other 10 people. Um, we had, like I think, seven stickers at the end of the day out of you know, everybody else's. And all the other projects were funded. So it's like, well. What do we do? And Kathy said, you know, there's a Sarah Grant deadline coming up. I think it was December 3rd. It was October 9th. And she said, let's consider applying for it. Who wants to take the time to write the grant? Well, unfortunately, I'm a fundraiser by trade. And I said, OK, I'll tackle it. And I said, but I need your help. And I went back to that Margaret Mead quote, you know, about a committed group of individuals who are making things happen. Everybody said, sure, I'll work on it. So we started with a core group of five people from a variety of different places on the agricultural map that met. We got together once a month. We talked about the initiative. We wrote the grant. And um, we're delighted to find that Sarah actually did fund this grant. 
And the grant was based around the fact that the man who sends the sheep sheep doesn't taste. And in Ohio, we have the wonderful raw material to, to make beautiful sheep cheese. We have good land, we have clean water, we have a fantastic climate for grazing. Um, we have everything that we needed to, to go ahead and do this. Yet nobody was doing it at this time. So the Sarah Grant, which did you guys all get a brochure? Okay. Um, in fact, I think we're going to provide the number of grant number, correct? So everybody can look it up online if they need to. That is something that you mentioned is that Sarah Grant's project reports are on our national Sarah site, and we can see the reports from all the Sarah Grants that have these in particular. And yeah, we'll, we'll get that at the end. If, uh, okay. So the goal was to, the goal of, of the Ohio Sheep Milk and Sheep Administrator, which is what it became known as under the Sarah Grant, was to determine the feasibility of the production of sheep milk in Ohio, to explore the possibility for value-added processing in the local artisan sheep cheeses and local artisan dairy products, because the, the market has been expanding even wider to include butter and ice cream, and um, there are even some folks that are, are Requesting now fluid milk. Maybe that will take that up next. So, you're like, oh, I love that. But uh, so great progress has been made um, in this. We we talked to farmers, we talked to consumers, we uh, did a lot of work with uh, a variety of academics from a variety of different places, and then we had nonprofit partners as well. So this this grant. Um, had, and you'll be able to see when you specifically look at the grant in the budget, had a variety of, of um, outreach opportunities. Okay? Our first outreach opportunity was something that we did um, at OSU, um, at OARDC, and OHUACI, and we brought in uh, uh, Yves Berger, who is a world renowned sheep dairy expert, to come and speak to. Um, folks in Ohio that were interested. And uh, we had a long workshop, we had Keith Berger there, um, we had the folks from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Spooner Ag Research Station, we had uh, Pat, um, Pat Elliott from Everona, who unfortunately has since passed. Uh, she came and talked about uh, Everona Dairy and uh, some of the beautiful cheese that are there. And we, she was the grand dam of cheap milk cheese, having been at it probably for 20 years. Um, and we had a day-long session uh, talking about cheese making, enterprise budgets, nutrition, grazing management. Uh, and at this workshop, we had 85 people attend. Okay? Fantastic. In addition, the day prior, we had uh, uh, the, all of these lecturers speak to the, um, the students at OSU ATI that were in the intro and beef and sheep class. So we had 50 students. A day long session, and when I go back and I look at the attendees from that workshop, okay, I'm delighted to say that of the eight businesses that are in Ohio right now that are actually working with sheep milk, the majority of them were physically in attendance that day. Okay. So that was a Sarah funded initiative. $16,000 was the total of it. The speaker fees, honorarium were covered by Sarah, that we could educate Ohio producers on making fantastic sheep milk. Uh, again, remember at the time, there was nobody doing anything. And we felt, as did Sarah, that, that there was great possibility here. You know, there's, uh, at the time, there was about 150 dairy sheep farms in the United States. And they're all over, okay? Um, but even with these sheep dairy farms, the United States still imports 66 million pounds of sheep milk cheeses a year. Okay? That's unbelievable. That's a fantastic amount. This amount in terms of gross receipts is about $118 million of imports for bringing other people's sheep milk cheeses into the United States. It's a huge market. So we went to consumers, we went to, consumers, we went to the chefs next with a survey. Um, survey, uh, we, we put up a survey monkey and it um, ask questions to consumers. Would you be willing to pay more for locally produced cheeses? Would you be willing to buy sheep cheese? It asks questions to farmers. Um, are you considering a dairy milking operation? Are you milking right now? Um, uh, do you have sheep, but you know you want to kind of expand your operation? Well, we ended up getting um, 263 
responses. Okay? Of these responses, 35% were from farmers, 10% were from the food industry, 4% were retailers, 51% 50 were consumers of cheese, I'm saying about the other 49 and 8 cheese. But um, we found that 86% of people said that they would pay more for a locally produced cheese. And uh, interestingly, of the people that were farmers, over 65% of them said that they would be interested in starting a dairy cheese operation. So this gave us uh, a little bit of a boost that we said, okay, what else can we do to, to build cheap dairy in Ohio that falls within our budget parameters for our sales? Well, we um, had uh, uh, the ability to bring in consultants, cheap making consultant, Peter Dixon, and we had a cheap making class um, at Sylvia Zimmerman's at uh, Holt Street Jersey, and uh, had the opportunity to um, training some folks on working in small vats. Uh, small vats are important. Anybody milking cows in here? Okay, good. So we have one. Anybody milking sheep in here? One. Anybody milking goats? Okay, good. A couple, good. Okay, so working on small quantities. Um, regardless of the quantity of milk that you're working with, the cheap making science remains the same. Um, when I studied at University of Wisconsin Madison, I was sitting next to a gentleman who worked for Sargento. And he does things in a uh, 56,000 pound vat. Okay. That's pretty big. Um, you know, I do things in a vat that's about this big. But even if you're at home doing things on your stove top, okay, the science is the same. The, uh, the scholarships that we offered then to some small producers that were interested in cheap dairying were to encourage folks to learn how to work on a small scale. Okay. Uh, the average cow gives how much a day? 40 to 150 pounds. Okay, 40 to 150 pounds. The average goat gives how much? A good goat and a gallon. A good goat and a gallon, that's right. Okay, and the average sheep? 60 to 9 pounds. Okay, so, um, okay, I'll take it. That's good. That's a good sheep. That's a good sheep. <laughs> that's right. That's a really that's good a, sheep. That's a, that's a dairy sheep. Right. Dairy right. Meat sheep. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So the, the, the answers were uh, a good cow gives you between 40 and 100 pounds. A good goat will give you about a gallon, which is 8.6 pounds. Um, and a good sheep will give you. 6 to 9 pounds, depending on the state of the Six to 9 pounds, depending upon the state of the lactation. So the scale of equipment that you're going to be working with is, is going to be very, very different. And these are some of the things that we did that we did talk about um, during the early stages of our uh, of our educational offerings for this Sarah Ohio Sheep Milk and Cheese Initiative grant. So we determined that there was interest, and we determined that there was consumer demand, and we determined that there was chef demand. So the next thing to do was to continue the educational offering, and we did this um, in October of eleven with a secondary workshop, which about 30 people attended, um, and that was co-hosted by um, our, farms at, our, our friends at uh, Heart of Ohio RCMD. And there we talked uh, about grazing management, about nutrition, and about um, small equipment. I believe uh, Lisa and Ben, you guys were speaking to that earlier. Right? Uh, talked about the different things to to consider when starting a, a dairy sheep operation. Um, ben mentioned something that very, very important, and that is roots. Okay? Um, milking sheep is, is a, a, a very, very challenging thing. All right? You only get approximately a quart a day, maybe a little more than a quart, right? A quart and a half? Well, sheep comes 8.9 pounds per gallon. Okay, 8.9 pounds per gallon. So if you're getting 6 to 8, that'd be 2, two, two to 3 quarts. Okay. Three or four quarts. You know, that's a lot of work for two to four quarts of milk. And um, you want to make sure that if you're going to start in a, a dairy sheep operation, that you have the right genetics or that you're working towards the right genetics. This obviously can be seen from the budgeting and business planning that you are doing in the beginning okay, of your exploration of this mission. Okay. It's hard enough to make money with the best genetics 
and the best nutrition, and the best land, and the best chefs, and the best market, you really want to make sure that you're stacking your own deck in your own favor, and that's by going in with the right genetics. The genetics would be very limited in the United States in terms of what genetics we do have um, available to us for dairy and sheep. Um, many folks will uh, cross or, or breed up um, with an uh, East region or a cone. And um, other folks can stick up with a Wasi too. Yeah, but very little. Okay. Yeah, I know that they're, they're looking to bring in some additional cheap genetics at this time. So, genetics are a very, very important thing, and that was one of the things that we did cover, um, in addition to no production, small equipment, and as I mentioned, the enterprise budgets. Okay? You want to make sure that you have very realistic projections in your budgeting for, um, for the sheep milk. And uh, we had a great workshop by a um, uh, uh, Eve Day, who came in and talked about the specific numbers of those. Okay? You know, what's the average price of cow milk going per hundred weight? Give me a ballpark. 20 to 25. Okay, 20 to 25. What's the average? Okay, so that's for every hundred pounds of cow milk, you're going to make 20 to 25 dollars. Okay, that's gross. Okay, for goat, what's the average price for goat milk? Uh, an average share about 14 dollars a gallon. Okay. That's a commodity. Yeah, as a commodity. Okay, I'll use that. I can tell you that I, well, um, I can say that it's between $25 and $40. Yeah, 25 and 40 based upon quality of the milk and the components. Okay. Um, sheep milk, the average price per 100 pounds of sheep milk is in the 80s, okay, in Ohio. All right? In New York, it's upwards to 110. All right? Now, remember, that sounds like a lot of money, right? Okay, but when you're pulling it down to a much smaller quantity of milk, the numbers very quickly can change. One of the advantages from a cheese making perspective is that cheap cheese, because cheap milk, excuse me, cheap milk, because of the higher components and the higher solids, tend to give you a higher yield. So one gallon of cheap milk will make more cheese than one gallon of goat milk or one gallon of so the numbers do, do change a little bit. Um, this initiative was, was also very, very key, keen to make sure that we talked about, um, about making sure that there was cross, not only processing capabilities, but that there was um, distribution. Okay? And the grant. The original seed money is about $16,000. I believe. I think the amount is like $16,800. Um, really was fantastic seed money. Um, it ended up spurring in Ohio um, educational offerings, people's interest, and uh, people did really just jump into the business. The simples were started uh, prior to uh, the, the whole SARE funding, correct? But you guys kind of came along with us in terms of attending some of the educational offerings. Um, as of this moment that I know, um, I believe there's either eight or nine um, businesses that are using sheep milk in some way, okay, in terms of licensed farms and dairies, in terms of processing capabilities, cream rates, and um, those that might be re raising breeding. So when the grant was written in October of 2009, to this very moment, there are eight businesses that didn't exist right, prior to uh, this particular grant. So that was 2009 through 11. In 10, I wrote a secondary grant, which did not get the funding. 2010 was a horrible year, if everybody remembers how miserable 2010 was for everybody um, in terms of funding and Question in uh, 2010, we wrote a secondary grant which was to build more infrastructure. Okay? To take the Ohio Sheep Milk and Cheese Initiative and to formalize it into something that continued to offer educational offerings. Okay? At that time, we didn't get that grant in 2010. And I say that because um, I don't know how many of you are considering writing a grant to SARE or any other funder 
but if you get a ding or a no, um, continue to apply. Okay? As a professional fundraiser, I've written many successful grants, and I've also written many failed grants. Okay? Um, the trick is to be able to go and just continue to write. And um, when you write that application, you know, follow the application guidelines, get it in on time, make sure that your project is clear, make sure that the funder is appropriate, and they're really funding what you want to fund. Um, but the SARE grant for us was a wonderful opportunity to to build an industry and to have a variety of farmers work together. Okay? Beth mentioned this was a farmer, this was a farmer rancher grant. So it physically came to the farm, not to the businesses. Okay? So our farm, Lucky Penny Farm, uh, was one of the farms. Uh, Brian Schlatter from Canal Junction Farm, um, town health producer uh, in Defiance, Paulson County, was another farm. Uh, Troy Cooper, who was an OSU Extension agent, um, they were raising um, uh, Finn and um, uh, well, uh, I don't remember the other group that they had, but they were trying to milk. Um, they had churro for a while. And uh, so one, and then there was one more farm that was, uh, and then Kathy Dealer, who was doing uh, research on parasites. So this is a group of four farmers that actually got together, worked on the grant, and then those monies were um, divided based upon people's roles and responsibility, or whether one person handled out the um, the, the upshot of all of it is, is that now we have a very healthy and growing sheet milk initiative um, in terms of businesses in Ohio that are that are providing cheap milk cheeses, um, providing um, whether it be internship and training opportunities at a variety of our farms, and providing a fantastic quality product to the chefs. So where do we go from here? Well, one of the challenges is that we built a product and we haven't successfully built the market. As I mentioned, with something is eighty dollars a hundred weight, okay. When you're going to a chef and you're saying this cheese wholesale is eighteen, nineteen, twenty dollars a pound, you know they're looking at you, and you'll get the question of, well, why should I buy that setup, you know, instead of, you know, when I can just go to the store right now and buy cows for three twenty nine a pound or go to the wholesaler, and you can use the local argument, but there still needs to be uh, a group of committed chefs. And folks that truly understand the value of, of sheep milk cheeses. And, um, and the value of supporting local farms and the value of supporting uh, in a new industry in Ohio. So that's one of the things that I see as our challenge right now. And um, maybe that'll be a future share project. Um, we're trying to build the market. I know that at the end of the season last year, I had excess inventory. Okay? I know that the two sheep farms that I work with. This year, our okay, the replacement the replacement ewes are going to be lambing. So I know that I have more milk coming than I had last year, and I had no fruit last year. How do we deal with this? Okay. You want to grow, you want to grow, but you need to make sure that there is a market for the product that you will be producing. Again, that rolls back to your business plan. Um, although a business plan wasn't required for this particular SARE project, um, we did craft one. Um, a small, uh, I think the business plan for producing sheet milk and cheese rice bars is maybe 10, 15 years. Okay. Um, but it's a very important thing. And it forces you to answer the questions that a farmer might answer or that uh, a future distributor might answer. You want to go through and you want to make sure do I have a way to produce this product? Do I have a way to distribute this product? Do I have someone who's going to buy this product? You know, and, and can I do it? So, um, when looking at your venture, uh, I, I can't strongly enough suggest to you just the importance of a business plan. Uh, often when I mention business plan, people say, is there a software program to use? I use Business Plan Pro. But Bob, there is an online one that is simple and free, which the folks at Braintree often recommend. Do you know what that is? There's actually several different plans that people can do. So obviously, you have to do it first on it. 
Um, the, the, the answer to that was that yes, there, there are many of us take a look online and uh, see what you can find out. But it is important to monitor because you want to make sure that your farmers are getting paid fairly. You want to make sure that um, you can make money on your product, you know, because um, although we spent a lot of time this weekend talking about sustainable businesses in terms of, you know, the definition of sustainability in terms of protecting the soil and water and paying our agricultural workers fairly, uh, sustainable also means sustaining in terms of being in business. And, you know, if we start a project and if we don't continue, you know, it's really, it's really So, business planning. Um, again, uh, I can't mention, I can't mention enough the importance of it. You know, for our framework, I can tell you that we're in our 14th version of our business plan. Um, it continues to change. Businesses are, you know, living, breathing entities. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing the right strategy to be able to grow not only our business, but uh, making sure that we're working to grow the opportunities for the farmers that we're working with. Okay. Um, so, we want to do that. Uh, make sure that we can support our farmers and support those that might be interested in processing with us and uh, in working with us in terms of a, a partnership to make sure that we are producing um, a, a beautiful farm. Okay, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about um, about the, uh, the survey again. Now, the survey was very important, but obviously it was something that um, couldn't be to be one-sided because you know, we targeted some of our, our farming friends and our farming community. One of the most important things that we found was the, the ability for people to, um, their willingness to pay more for a local product. Okay? And I know that we probably talked a lot about this weekend already. But people are willing to pay up to 30% more to buy local. And this is something that's particularly important when we are producing a value added product that is not only 30% more than what the average cost is, but in many instances it could be double um, of what. The commodity price, you know, for cheese X in the supermarket may be. Right? Why are people going to do this? Well, we know that local foods, people can stay in local foods because not only do they feel that this is supporting the farm that they might be working with or supporting their local community, it makes them feel good. So we want to make sure that uh, in our marketing that we're letting people know our marketing. You know, about what we're doing to be sustainable, that way we can justify their 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 ability to, to pay more, their want and their ability to pay more. Um, you know, uh, some of the marketing messages you use, um, you just make statements in terms of some of the things that you do for your CSA. Throw one out. Um I mean we 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 do things like pop ups with our seat. We also do Vegetable CSA on our farm too. So, um, so really, that that reconnection with people, so they can see their food, um, that level of transparency that you have to have when you're marketing a local product. Um, I mean, in, in the case of our sheep dairy, um, our sheep dairy is, is a farmstead cheese. So, I mean, we like to talk about that from birth on. We're growing. Like everything is happening in our control is not a good term with the way the weather's been the last couple of years, but um, um, under our management. So, so that makes a very, uh, a very important point in terms of some of the benefits of some of the things they're talking about uh, in their marketing. And you mentioned farmstead, okay? So when you're looking at artisan cheeses or farmstead cheeses, farmstead cheeses are made and produced. At the location where the sheep are. So the sheep typically are part of the born there, the milk there, and then the cheeses are made there and then distributed out um, into whether it be restaurants or, or food service or farmers markets from there. Uh, that's slightly different than artisan where things are still still made in, still made primarily by hand in small batches, but uh, the animals not necessarily live in farm same soil. Okay. And in Ohio, we have a, a, our wonderful cheese community. We have many farmstead producers, we have many artisan producers. And um, it's, it's a wonderful 
thing to let your customer know that, you know, it's like, yes, we are doing things in small batches. Yes, our animals are born here. You're taking care of them. Um, it is a very important thing. And once again, it justifies that increased cost to the market. You have to tell people why they should spend a little more money to purchase your product. Some folks don't understand, you know, the high costs of, of raising livestock in, in a challenging year. And it's our job to educate and inform to be able to have folks um, understand why the price of that cheese um, exists in that way. And we know from our survey that um, the customers are willing to do, um, do that. Uh, so where, where is this all going to go from here? Well, um, our original intent was to understand the opportunity for sheep milk and cheese in Ohio and to understand um, the partnerships that our nonprofits and that our academic institutions could bring. And we also started to understand our consumer in terms of their ability to support and promote uh, Ohio cheese, whether they sheep, goat, um, water buffalo. I know there was somebody, one person trying to do water buffalo in Ohio. Um, not didn't go very far, very fast. <laughs> but um, but there, there really is some good in that. Good luck to them. I hope you make it. But, um, so we, we, we took a look at that, and it was good because it kind of moved our industry forward um, in, in that capacity. From a sheep perspective, many folks, who are you to raise a sheep? Okay. From a sheep, <laughs> not dairy sheep, that's all right. Uh, from a sheep perspective, it was very interesting because many folks, when I went and spoke at the Buckeye Shepherd Symposium, or I went to Ohio Sheep Day, uh, many folks say, well, why would you milk a sheep? You know, it was such a foreign thing. We're so used to thinking of, of sheep as wool or meat that we forget that this animal can give us yet one more gift, and that is beautiful, high quality milk. Okay? Sheep milk is the highest in vitamins, it's the highest in minerals, it's the highest in fat, and it's the highest in protein, correct, too, right? Of the common milk. Okay, of the common looking mammals. I always tell people you can have a bat if you want to. A bat? It's a mammal. Okay. I actually, years ago, like 15 years ago, I heard Wes Jackson um, spin the idea of milking bats as the farming of so. That's not something I want to do. You can milk bats, you can milk whales, you can milk I mean, camels. There are, there are places that milk camels. Um, it's hard when you call your dairy equipment. Supplier, though, when you say you want to make bats, because they don't make calls for bats. Yes. And equipment is, is an important thing, um, especially when you're getting to some of these animals, you know, some of these not commonly milk um, animals. Uh, there are wonderful, even, even in Ohio now, I think that you've even seen it, I've seen a sea change in terms of the ability for people to answer your questions in regards to milk and smaller. Okay. Um, when I first started, you know, when I would go into whether it be a farmer or an equipment person and I'd talk about milking dairy goats, they'd be like, what? You know, why would you milk a goat? Right, well, okay, if we can make tea, why would you milk a sheep? You know, they're only going to get this one. Um, well, it's because it gives us a different milk and a different profile that needs a specific need from a chef or a consumer. To me. So, um, it gives us that, you know, the experience, just keep on moving forward. And, um, and find equipment manufacturers. There are many uh, online, and there are many local um, dairy folks that will be happy to kind of point you in the right direction for equipment and um, and people that will be helpful for milking on a smaller scale. Okay? Because the equipment does need to be right size, um, because you're dealing with much less quantity now. So um, we can make sure that you know, we can talk about specifics. Um, after this. Okay. In, in closing, there's a couple things I do want to say about um, working with um, SARE and a funder. Um, in regards to our uh, grant, uh, there are many changes along the way that we had, and SARE was great in terms of kind of turning on the dime or letting us take advantage of a particular opportunity. Um, some of us went to um, the Utah Dairy Chief North America Conference and you know Claire and uh, had the opportunity to learn and, and you know get even deeper in 
terms of um, of working with their issue prior to pulling in and had any on, on the ground here. Um, I had the opportunity to go to uh, their issue uh, school in Splinter, Wisconsin, and it was in April, and I quickly learned that I, I, I'm probably not the girl to be milking, you know, 400 sheep twice a day in 10 degree weather in a foot of snow. Um, you know, you learn these things, but uh, it gave us hands-on experience to to really bring something back to Ohio that started um, a, a what I believe today is a thriving and growing industry now. So I encourage you, you know, I encourage you to apply for whatever project it is. Um, take the time to do it. If you do not get funded the first time, apply again. If you do not get funded the second time, apply again. Okay, uh, because uh, the Ohio Sheep Milk Achievement Initiative is wonderful example of how something can go from, you know, something on a sticky note to uh, eight businesses that are now contributing to the Ohio economy uh, with a $16,000 okay. I want to make sure that I have ample time for questions, so at this point we have 20 minutes for questions, and uh, I'll do my best to repeat your question. I was just wondering, um, so when you talk a lot about how definitely there seems to be demand in the market for this, um, I was wondering about have, how, how do farmers, um, how have they been encountering finding the right kind of equipment for a small scale sheep there? Is, that, is, there, is it hard to find? Is it easy to find? Um, the question is uh, how can farmers find right sized equipment for small ruminant bears? Um, and uh, the Dairy Sheep Association of North America uh, puts on a, a wonderful conference every year. And at the trade shows, uh, there often is a variety of equipment manufacturers that, um, that do things for smaller than so whether milking equipment or um, for gates, shoots, you know, small parlors. Uh, so, but I would, I would type the machine to go to the and do a Google search. And you'll find a few different things and places. There also are, um, at conferences such as this, uh, there often is equipment manufacturers that will make uh, that will fabricate for you. Uh, I know that I've worked in Ohio Fabricator, and I, I believe you guys probably have done this in custom fabrication done too, at Coco Correa. So um, there, it is out there. So, but right size is, is critical. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of talk about equipment. Is it unreasonable for a person to think that they would do this by hand? Uh, you can milk sheep by hand for like yourself, but to milk sheep by hand and make, I mean, if you go, there's a there's a book you can download from Wisconsin. All the research pretty much is out of Wisconsin. There's a little out of Cornell. Um, and they will give you scale kind of um, like under 20, Sheep, you're probably going to milk by hand. Up to 100, you're probably going to milk in buckets. Well, bu bucket is with a pneumatic cloth sager and actual cloth. Um, above that, you're going to start milking in pipelines. We're actually we're in the process um, putting in a pipeline, so it'll be the first sheep pipeline in Ohio. Um, and as far as sourcing equipment, there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of it's junk. Um, the first cause that we bought, they sell them at any dairy supply place you can go into. You can buy them. They're manufactured by the worst tolerances ever, which make clean and everything a nightmare. But that's what they'll, I won't, I'm not gonna say what it is, but that's what they'll sell you if you go into any number of Ohio dairy equipment places. We're actually having claws sent from Germany for our new Highline parlor. Um, and dealing with that, the distributor said, oh, we'll, we'll have to wait for the next container on a boat. But well, realize that this is like 20 pounds of stuff. And so when I said, well, I'll just call some, I'll call a, a farmer friend in France and he can go to the deal and pick them up for me. They're like, oh, we can get them here a little quicker than that. Mm -hmm. um, so the equipment is, I mean, in general though, other than your actual setup of your facility, claws and stuff are really the thing that is the most unique animals. We've made use of a lot of what you would call antiquated cow milking equipment. Um, 
in terms of not many people put in a pile of five parts vacuum pump in house anymore, but for sheep it works. So, and there's be, luck because of the collapse of small family dairies in this country, there's a lot of gold and houses out there. So, um, so we can, you can, you can bootstrap to begin. Okay, I and that's what we we've, we've done. I mean, we started out with buckets, and we had a six gate heads head gates, and then we've we kind of built our whole thing to eventually be a double hen parlor where we can milk. And the biggest thing that you'll hear about milking sheep, it needs to be done in about an hour because um, your sheep go nuts if it takes more than an hour. You go nuts. You make mistakes. And there are some people we've run into who are like, and it's, it's the same in milking cows. You'll run into people who are like, oh, it takes me. I actually, a friend just is working on a, putting a new uh, system in a cow. It takes him five hours a day, five hours of milking to milk all these cows in the high cell barn. And he's going to robots. He, he has no idea what he's going to do with his life. <laughs> he's going to get into, he's like a kid, he's going to get into trouble. We're milking about 100 this year. Um, the question was how many were at Wolf Cup of Bird and milking about 100 this year? I don't know, there's not how many acres. Well, we, we have 77 acres and then run hay ground. It's not all devoted to sheep. Um, and by having that kind of buffer, we can, I mean, we grow some annual. Cover crops that we can create. We can either plow down or graze them. So, I mean, in the kind of weather changes we've had in Ohio with grazing, you got to be flexible. Um, and with sheep dairying, because it's so geographically diverse in this country, when you go to the sun or something, I remember when we went to the sun the first time, you hear about these guys grazing this many on this, this, you, all of that kind of information when it's so geographically diverse, you have to take with a grain of salt. At, at the Spooner Research Station, the research flock in Wisconsin, they graze 300 ewes on 30 acres of irrigated pasture. Uh, how much does that uh, very low because of the rotation. They move every 12 hours. Oh, yeah. We move every 12 hours in the grazing season um, to, to get the kind of flavor profile, consistent thing, consistent diet, everything. Most grazing dairy farms. So it looks, looks, resistance it looks you need to move them through fast. It looks, right. it looks crazy too, because you know people drive by and they see a hundred sheep on this tiny little thing, and they're like, what, what's that person doing with all those sheep in a tiny little pasture? Right. Um, pasture management is a, it's a, it's a, a political charge thing, and you get people to fight when you talk about how you manage pasture. So, but rotational grazing is, is key, and, and the animal along is key because parasites are, you know, healthier animal is going to be quality milk. So as production level of your milk. So that's first and foremost. Okay, well let's take back even one step and you know the healthier animal is going to be quality of you know your grazing and, and the health of your soil. Take back that your farm. So you know it's you know in, in managing in this way it is a holistic picture. And in order to have the highest quality cheeses you need you know, highest quality milk coming from good forage and a balanced nutrition program. So, I did want to go back to talk one second about um, the, uh, as I mentioned, bootstrapping. We started with the cow. We started milking goats for an old size cow, okay, a modern size cow probably. And that worked for a little bit. Um, and in terms of the scale of how many goats you or cow or sheep, whatever it is, how many you can milk in a set amount of time. You know, I was comfortable milking 40 at a time by myself. But once I surpassed that, I just it didn't feel it wasn't comfortable for me. Sheep are are I said I've never had Well in, in like in a sheep situation, we're starting out with five cloths on a high line parlor. And because of the speed of milk out of a sheep, one person can only without automatic cluster removal can only handle five or six claws without over milking. Um, and so it's those kind of things. And the information's all out there about designing a parlor and things like that. Um, over milking is one of the worst things you can do to a dairy animal. Um, but it, it, it's fast. I mean, we've had, we have 
we're also an artisan cheese producer. We buy cow's milk from a, a family grazing dairy by us. And the first time cow people watch a sheep farm milk sheep in the parlor, it's so fast. And like even the sheep, like cows kind of mosey in, they walk through the head gates and, and this and that. And I mean, you have to design your sheep handling for rockets. <laughs> because when you open the, the, the gate going out of the parlor, they're taking off. Um, and actually, one of the problems with sheep and one of the, the health issues we deal with with our sheep every year is we mow. 95% of our mastitis cases have been because we're dealing with rockets in our parlor and they will shoot somewhere and get an injury or something like that and that's what you, so to try to have, I actually now basically don't let anyone in the parlor when I'm milking. Um, and lots of cow old dairymen swear by the same routine, the same people. It's not a spectacle. Um, these animals are working. Um, it's kind of like the difference between a herring dog and a guard dog and your pet that curls up on the foot of your bed. These are working animals. Part of giving a humane environment to a farm animal is keeping their life stress-free. Um, and so we basically milk by ourselves. We have kids too, which that, and they milk with us, so that sometimes is more harm than good. Um, okay, so a great place to start doing some research is um, there's a little bit of publication which will be see your turn and called The Principles of Sheep Dairying in North, North America. Um, it is a University of Wisconsin publication. Um, they sell it, but if you dig hard, you can find a PDF of it already. Okay? It's so, easier to find a PDF than it is to find a book. Oh, Because okay. it's basically automatic. Okay. So, um, uh, so principles of, of sheep dairying. So that's, that's always a great place to start, too. It's a nice publication. And if you said, oh, get your wheels turning on the right way, if you can help you shoot the subject that you are interested in. Any other questions? Yeah. Are the people who are milking sheep usually making sheep, or are the people milking sheep and turning the milk over to sheep makers? Both, in the state of Ohio. Um, we have two farms that are milking, that milking sheep, and then turning it into cheese. And then we have three farms that are milking sheep and turning it over to processors to make cheese. Are there any sheep dairy producers here? I don't know. Not that there are on anybody's radar. Okay. That's probably the right answer. We get that question a lot at farmers market. Um, usually it is a question that uh, from a person who has never had sheep milk. Um, the majority, of, I mean, sheep milk is is mostly made into cheese and yogurt. Um, there's really no sheep's milk. We're, we're actually, our dairy is on test, which means we have a monthly DHI test. Um, and we had animals last year approaching 9% butter fat and 6.5% protein. Um, it's high test milk. It's not really, um, it would be kind of like drinking half and half. Yeah, most people, and, and like at farmer's market, one lady asked, that asked me, I said, well, what kind of milk do you normally drink? And she drinks skim milk. It's like skim milk, right. Okay. I'm like, yeah, come on. Uh, <laughs> and, and a lot of people ask me things that they don't know what they're asking for either. So, okay, Bob? You were talking earlier about the sustainability of the business itself. Was it the business model canvas that you were referring to? It's about the online tool to try to uh, analyze your business and map it out. And even if not, I recommend that. Okay, what is the name of the tool called? Business Model Canvas, and sometimes it's called the Lean Startup Canvas. And essentially, it takes a business plan, like what well, might be a 50 page business plan, and distills it into one chart where you can very easily look at who are your resources, who are your customers, what's your value proposition, what's your revenue stream, and it gives you a very good representation of how sustainable that business can be. And that is called the Business, the model, business canvas. model Canvas. Yes. Lean startup. Lean startup. Yes. I have seen it, and there it's actually it's a beautiful, beautiful document. You know, just to be able to, to crystallize all of your thoughts, goals, and aspirations on one page. That you know, that's a beautiful thing. So many times when people undertake something like this, because of some of the equipment and the capital needs, they think about doing it as a cooperative, uh, so that it's small producers nearby can share. So tomorrow morning we'll have a session here in introduction to cooperatives for those of you that may 
think you flawed in that and aren't quite sure how to go about it. And then sometimes the route people go is joining with other people where they're actually co-owners of the business and trying to decide, you know, I'll loan 30% and you'll loan 50 and you'll do this and that. I think one of the pricing things that when they talk, because I remember being like the earliest in the early 90s, the University of Wisconsin looking at how much sheep cheese we can import. And even back then, the thing about the importation of sheep milk products in this country, lots of them are from Eastern Europe or quasi second, third world countries where, um, where they're bringing in very cheap stuff. We had a distributor one time who brought in stuff from Eastern Europe and he was asking about feta. And he's like, I can bring feta for $2 a pound. We're like, Right, and, and I hear that as well too. It's like, I could get that cheese for X, and, and I even, said, you go right ahead. Because. Even when you get to Europe, like in Italy, that has lots of, of the pecorinos and stuff, um, we work with a distributor who only carries American artisan and cheeses, and that's his, like, you get him going on the imported European name control cheeses, he will flip, because it's like, people do not realize those are industrial cheeses, like the non-branded, Pecorinos. That is an industrial cheese. It's not some quaint woman over a copper kettle <laughs> milking 20 sheep by hand and making these beautiful pecorinos. It's, Even though that might be the picture on the label. Well, more than, no, the worst thing is it's the tour. It's, it's the tour they take you on. Uh, a lot of the, so I think you have to talk. We just have 10 minutes to switch. I want to make sure okay. we're thinking of him. Can you comment to generate more discussion? So I hope you'll be talking on the hallway to the talk to you. Thank you, Ben, for your input. I appreciate that.